Okay, so today we are going to talk about flash calculations and distillation. So these are two separation procedures uh, for vapor liquid equilibrium. So flash calculations and distillation. Now, based on the conversations that I had with some individuals yesterday, it sounds like a lot of you already are pretty familiar with flash calculations. Uh, so we're going to go through them uh, reasonably quickly. So a flash separator or a flash drum, so in general in thermodynamics, flash, a flash calculation is basically any equilibrium calculation. We are calculating the composition of every phase and the quantity of every phase. So a flash calculation could be solid liquid, it could be vapor liquid, it could be liquid liquid. Those all count as flash calculations. But in general, this is sort of a flash drum, which is sort of the most inviting of the uh, sort of chemi separators. Uh, entering in this flash drum, we have Z of I, which we use to denote the total composition entering the system. Typically, this is going to be a liquid. In general, in a chemical process, liquids are easy to handle, gases are difficult to handle. Question? Oh, yeah, don't pull down that. So in general, if you can transport a liquid, it's much easier to transport a liquid. If you can pressurize a fluid, you'd much rather pressurize a liquid than you would a vapor. So in most processes, if you can make it a liquid, it's going to be a liquid. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So this could be, this could be a, a, a multi-phase feed to the flash drum. Inside of the drum, it is going to be held constant at some particular temperature and pressure. Out of the bottom, you will have the liquid phase mole fraction and the total quantity of the liquid or the molar liquid flow rate. And out of the top, you'll have the vapor phase composition and the total vapor flow rate. More often than not, the feed will be fixed to one mole or kilomole per unit of time. Right, so everything's normalized to make it simpler. Okay, so this is nothing more than what we've already done. The only difference here is that it's not a bubble point and it's not a dew point, but all of the equations are exactly the same. So what we have access to are equilibrium expressions and material balances. So if we write down all of our equations, we have mass consistency, Right, just based on the definition of what a mole fraction is, we cannot violate these expressions. That's just how it is. No, no manipulation possible. So this is consistency. And we have a number of mass and mole balances. We have a total mole balance. In the case of F is equal to V plus L, the feed flow rate is equal to how much leaves in the uh, vapor phase to how much leaves in the liquid. It's a steady state process, no accumulation of material in the system. And we can also write out species balances. In this case, we can write it in a generalized form where the total mole fraction in the feed times by the feed flow rate itself is equal to how much is leaving in the liquid versus how much is leaving in the vapor, right? The mole fraction times by the total molar flow rate gives us the flow rate of that particular species, I. In this case right here, we could call this Ni vapor phase, for example, based on a particular nomenclature scheme, right? N being the molar flow rate, sorry, N dot of species I in stream V, which is the vapor stream. And lastly, we have vapor-liquid equilibrium relationships, where the partial fugacity of the liquid phase for every species has to be equal to the partial fugacity. Now, every single one of these subscript equations I, we have one of those equations for every single species in the system. So if it's a three-component flash separator, right, three equations for every single one of these. In the case of, let's say, petroleum distillation, 
an effectively infinite number of components, right? So in petroleum, you are forced to develop pseudo-component classes. Otherwise, everything in thermodynamics falls apart. You have to lump things together. Otherwise, you have an infinite number of components, which means you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, which means you have an infinite number of equations you have to solve. So in petroleum, you have to have distillation cuts. You just have to say, OK, these are all going to be behaving the same way. You just lump them together, so on and so forth. Now, we have approximated this expression here, typically with Routes law, where we assume an ideal vapor phase and ideal mixing. Or in the case of what we just talked about, we can have some extent of non-ideal mixing. Right, and this is called modified Routes law. But basically, it's just substituting in non-ideality non expressions into Routes law. Right, we have non-ideality in the liquid phase and non-ideality in the vapor phase. So ultimately, that's it. That's a flash calculation, right? Just solve all of the equations. You need to solve for the mole fractions of the liquid and vapor, which is the composition of the liquid and vapor, and the liquid and vapor total flow rates. Or you could be given a composition and you have to solve for the temperature or pressure. Or maybe you know the outlet conditions, you need to solve for the inlet conditions. It's just a matter of degrees of freedom, and it's a big system of equations. For Routes law, it's effectively all linear expressions, unless you don't know the temperature. And the temperature enters in in the saturation pressure here. So if you don't know the temperature, then of course you're stuck with a system of nonlinear equations. But ultimately, all these calculations, they're just figure out how's the best way to do it sort of on your own, because you will need to know how to do a flash calculation by hand for quizzes or exams. Now, I will go over one general strategy. This is for what I would call like a straightforward flash calculation, where you know the feed conditions and you don't know the outlet conditions, and you know the temperature and pressure. So I'll go really quickly, because for two components, a flash calculation is relatively trivial, right? If you tinker around for 10, 15 minutes, you'll probably substitute the things in the right way and get it to work out. For three or more components, analytically rearranging it can be kind of tedious. Question, yes? If we were to see an exam, how, what, how many components would be four or three? If you follow this one simple strategy, you can solve it for any arbitrary number. It just gets tedious to put them all down? Right, right, right. So I, I'm fully aware of sort of the tedium and things like that. And so so I, I wouldn't want to ask anything unreasonable on an exam in terms of large amount of number crunching or large amount of non-ideal solutions. Okay, so if we have a flash for an arbitrary number of components, there's a nice convenient system that has been already worked out, so I'll, we'll walk through that really quickly. <clears throat> First, we're going to define a term called K, which is the relative volatility. Mathematically, it's just the mole fraction of the vapor for a species divided by the mole fraction of the liquid. Right? So if K is greater than 1, that means you've got more species I in the vapor phase than you do in the liquid phase. Right? It wants, it wants to, to be boiling more. So if we substitute this into Routes law, we can just simply write this as the ratio between the vapor pressure and the system pressure. Or for a non ideal system, we just have some additional terms of non ideality. The nice thing about this approach is it takes a lot of the math out of the, you know, the main expression that we're solving, it just lumps it into this nice convenient k term. So it just reduces the number of things you got to deal with. So we're going to solve this for the feed is equal to 1 mole per second if it's a flowing system, or maybe just 1 mole if this is a, a batch system, right? This, the flash separator doesn't have to be a flowing system. It could just be a closed container. You can still do a flash calculation on it. So if we do a total balance on the system, 
we have one, which is equal to the feed, is just the total flow rates of the liquid and the vapor added together. We're going to repeat the process, but instead of doing the total balance, we're going to do it for just one particular species I. So if this is an A-B mixture, this could be an A balance or a B balance. In this case here, we'll write Z of I, the mole fraction coming in, right? Normally, we would times this by the feed flow rate to give us the total number of moles coming in, but we've assumed that's one, so it goes away. I'll just write it out, and then I will go one, just to have it there. Uh, this is going to be just equal to the total amount leaving in the vapor phase plus the total amount leaving in the liquid phase. And so we're just going to play around with the substitutions a little bit. First we'll do the nice, simple, obvious one, right, where we just throw in the total balance into the species balance. We've eliminated one unknown so far. Next we will toss in the K. We're getting close. We're down to two unknowns. Right, the K can be calculated based on the pure species properties if it's, a, if it's an ideal mixture. So then lastly, we put in our consistency relationship where the sum of the mole fractions in the vapor phase have to be equal to one, and we can derive an expression as such. So we've taken this to an arb from an arbitrary number of components with an arbitrary number of uh, equations down to one equation with one unknown. The only unknown, this expression right here, is the total quantity of the vapor phase. And that's, of course, assuming that we know what the K factor is. Right? For an ideal mixture, we can calculate that with just only pure species properties. So just to finish this off really quickly, <clears throat> once we know V, we can solve for L, which is equal to 1 minus V, right? The total liquid flow rate is going to be just the basis minus how much of it goes into the vapor phase. If we take any of our species balances, We already know the V, we already know the L, we've already calculated that. So we can rewrite this expression pretty quickly. In terms of things that we already know. Right, the equation that I have listed right here, right, that's one equation, one unknown. Only the y is unknown. We can solve for that. And then if we have a vapor-liquid equilibrium expression, such as Routes law, that relates the liquid phase composition to the vapor phase composition, and we can solve for everything. So when a flash calculation is fully balanced, that means we know the composition of every species in every phase and the total amount of each phase. So if this were a liquid-liquid flash separation, you would need to know what phase the composition of liquid 1 was, the composition of liquid 2, and the total amount of liquid 1 and the total amount of liquid 2. That would be a liquid-liquid flash calculation. This is a vapor-liquid flash calculation. But in order to have it fully balanced, there must be no unknowns. We have to know the temperature, the pressure, the compositions, and the amounts of all the phases. And that is a flash calculation. So following this approach, for routes, anything that involves routes law or ideal vapor liquid equilibrium, this is exceptionally algorithmic. For a two component system, there are a lot of other different ways to do this. I highly recommend 
that when you're faced with a two-component flash calculation, for example, like on the homework, do it out by hand because there's a lot of different ways that I can throw a wrench into this. Right? I might not give you the pressure. I might not give you the temperature. I might give you the vapor composition have to solve for the feed composition. This strategy here is good for if it's a straightforward calculation. You know the feed and you know the temperature and you know the pressure. But since I've given it to you here, I'm probably not going to ask it on an exam. Right? So there's a lot of ways that I can flip this around. So being familiar with the equations is probably the most uh, important part. Okay, any questions on a vapor liquid flash calculation? Yes? Let me just write that out just to make it clear so there's no uncertainty here. So we can write out in Routes Law, right, in this case this would be the vapor liquid equilibrium expression that we're using. We've taken the fugacity as being equal, we've simplified it down to Routes Law, and in this expression we know the pressure, we know the vapor composition, we know the saturation pressure, so we can solve for the liquid composition. Yes? But I already have Ki, right? So can you use Ki? Oh yeah, you choose Ki too. That makes sense, yeah. That's effectively the same thing, just simplified already. Yeah. Okay, now on to distillation. So in many respects, distillation can sort of be thought about as a series of flash calculations put together. Strictly speaking, it is not, because for a distillation column, you have two flow rates going into every single equilibrium stage, whereas for a flash calculation, you have one. But conceptually, it's kind of similar. So I'll draw out a general schematic of a distillation column. Again, we have a feed. That's going to have a total composition, a big distillation column. So hopefully this does not look too out of the ordinary. Anyone who has a chemical engineering background should hopefully be able to draw a distillation column kind of in their sleep, especially going through the senior design. But not being from a chemical engineering background, uh, this may be a new, uh, a, a new thing to see how it detailed works. Okay. A couple of definitions that we'll need. Q, we'll call the reflux ratio. We'll define this as the amount of liquid being added back into the column divided by how much is removed from the column in D, which is the distillate. So as D goes to zero, Q goes to infinity, and we call this infinite reflux. Now, that's the only thing we're going to talk about with distillation is infinite reflux. Right? This is not, strictly speaking, a separations class, but distillation, you could spend weeks on distillation talking about a number of different ways to design and optimize one of these. But most of the conversation comes into mass transfer and mass balances in terms of the difference. But the vapor liquid equilibrium is best characterized in this infinite reflux scenario. Okay, so how a distillation column works is we have a feed coming in and then within the distillation column we have a series of equilibrium vapor liquid stages. So if I call this stage I, 
I believe in the notes that I have here, and the typical convention is that the, is that the number of stages count up going down lower. Typically, the pressure is constant in the distillation column. So the temperature it is, is what is varying. So I, I don't know if I have it on these sheets, but don't, don't cheat necessarily. Which is going to be hotter, top or bottom? Bottom. Bottom is going to be hotter. Right? Bottom is going to be enriched in the less volatile species. The top is going to be enriched in the more volatile species that boil easier. So the temperature uh, goes up as I increases. Well, that's not a very good way to write it. The temperature increases as you get closer to the bottom. Yes? So I thought with the distillation tower, you actually had a change in pressure just due to like the bubble caps did create a different type. Oh, there might be. There might be all that kind of stuff like that. There will be slightly different uh, changes in pressure because it's a flowing system and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but in general, for our calculations, we're going to assume that everything is a constant pressure okay. for simplicity. We're not going to deal with any of the actual complexities of a real distillation column. like not fully reaching equilibrium. Okay, so what ends up happening in a distillation column, right, is that all of the volatile liquids keep on bubbling up and bubbling up, and eventually you have a pure vapor stream that leaves out of the top of the column. You have a condenser. This could be either a partial or a total condenser. And what it does is it generates some liquid to kick back into the column. Now, why is this necessary? I've been trying to find this quote, but there's a quote by some sort of a chemist back in the day, essentially on the lines of, you know, why would you take all this effort to purify something and then just throw it back into the mixture? Yeah, why do we need this? The textbook says you have to do it in order to maintain vapor and liquid equilibrium, but I had another question I was wanted to ask about this is also, is that in order to help continue to purify even more, or is it already as pure as it's going to get, and it's just to maintain the vapor liquid? In order to do the separation, you need to have both liquid and vapor. So it's kind of a, you need both. So in order to purify it, you need to throw some back in it. Otherwise, every distillation stage is really effectively only a uh, single, com single, single stage separation. So for example, like in chemistry, who has a chemistry background? So, so if everyone has a chemistry background, fractional distillation, Right, where you kind of, I don't know, jam some steel wool or something like that in top, that's effectively distillation, right? So that's, instead of having discrete stages, that packing is acting as effective stages. So the notion, right, that if you were to take the gas that kind of goes off and you condense it and you capture it in your jar and that's your purified component, right? Right, it seems, oh, that's, it's silly. Let's take some of that and pour it back in. Well, well, that's actually exactly what's happening inside the packing already, right? because that packing will condense some of the vapor and it'll drip back down, right? And where that condenses and starts to drip back down is effectively the delineation between different stages. So fractional distillation is effectively just distillation, but this last step right here is not a total condenser. It would, would sorry, it would just be, you would not necessarily have much of a, uh, you would do a partial condenser or something like that, right? You would just take the vapor that comes off and throw the liquid back in. But that's effectively the last stage of a fractional distillation from sort of a chemistry's perspective. Um, okay, <clears throat> same concept in the reboiler, right? You need to have vapor bubbling up through the column. If you don't have vapor bubbling up through the column again, you don't have vapor liquid equilibrium. So if you don't have contact of the vapor and liquid at different temperatures, at different compositions, you only are effectively getting one separation stage, like treating this as a big giant flash drum. Right. So in order to take advantage of the distillation, you need to ensure that you have contact between the liquid and vapor. And so how this is typically done in like the really old school perspective is a bubble cap. So a stage would look something like this, where you would have liquid here, and then vapor bubbles would basically have to pass through the liquid phase to get up. And this is called a bubble cap because these bubbles are going to, well, bubble up through these mushroom-shaped caps. So at every single one of these stages, 
you have something that effectively looks like this, where you have the, the liquid being trapped in sort of a tray that eventually slowly drips down, and the bubbles that get bubbled up, and they have to pass through the liquid. Okay, <clears throat> so now, oh wow, look at that, I timed it well. Okay, so this is exactly what we're talking about, but in terms of a material balance, okay? This is all of the different properties of every different stage. So at every stage, you have liquid, and you have vapor, and you have a total amount of liquid, and you have a total amount of vapor. So every single stage, you know, one through I, right, and then the reboiler is another stage, the condenser could be another stage, right, every single one of those is going to have its own liquid and vapor composition. So if you look at it, and this is, this is just, just written for a two-component system, right, let's say stage I, we have some composition of the liquid phase, some composition of the vapor phase, and some total amount and temperature of that particular stage itself. So in a distillation column, you're effectively having to do some sort of a flash calculation for every single stage that we've got. So it's kind of a lot of work. Now, we can imagine if we were trying to do vapor-liquid equilibrium for a distillation process, for a multi-component mixture, let's say like petroleum, kind of would be nice to have an equation that just handles everything for us. And that's why we have Peng-Robinson and SRK equations. Right? Because if we had an equation that we could automate and solve for an arbitrary number of stages, for an arbitrary mixture, for arbitrary mixing rules, then we can basically just directly solve these types of expressions. But if we have to do any sort of a lookup or any sort of an iterative procedure, it just makes a distillation calculation effectively impossible. Right, so that's why it's so very valuable to have these cubic equations of state that are accurate, that can accurately predict liquid properties, accurately predict phase equilibrium, because when you toss it into a mixture as complex as this, and having you know, five, 10 stages of separation, that's a lot of calculations to do. So distillation is an exceptionally expensive, energy intensive, difficult to design process. So we're gonna do the simple version. <clears throat> Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, you can take notes on, on, on your handout there so you don't have to copy it down, but it's a lot going on. We're going to look at just the top stage, stage one. Okay, so we're going to do a uh, mole balance or a mass balance, but I'll call it a mole balance on stage one. Now this is going to be the top stage just before the condenser, right? So just before the vapor leaves out of the top of the column, this is the stage that we're looking at. So if we were to draw out our particular stage here, stage one, we are going to have a liquid coming down from the condenser. We are going to have vapor leaving from stage one. Right now, of course, this liquid has a particular composition, so it has a series of XIs. This vapor has a particular composition, so it has a series of VIs. And similarly, we are going to have liquid from stage one dripping down in the form of this L1 here, and we're going to have vapor coming up from the stage below. And then you can imagine that there's stage after stage after stage after stage going on down the distillation column. And they're all going to have their own particular temperature and, you know, right, they're going to have, you know, different compositions. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume this is, of course, steady state. And we're going to assume infinite reflux. So Q is equal to infinity. We have infinite reflux in this particular system, which means right, that anything, if we go back to our diagram here, right, if we have infinite reflux, that means we have no distillate coming out. So all of the vapor that leaves out of the top gets put right back in as a liquid. So at infinite reflux, we're not actually making any products, right, but this is a good conceptual calculation to do because it tells us the minimum number of stages. So as soon as you start to open one of these valves, you have to have more columns or, or more stages. But the infinite reflux case is the minimum number of stages necessary. Okay. <clears throat> so if we look at a total balance, I'll 
on stage one, we will get that L, so in this case it's in equals out, right? There's no accumulation, it's all steady state. So everything that goes in has to leave eventually. So let's draw out the things that are going in. L0 plus V2 is equal to V1 plus L1, right? So all the stuff from stage one is leaving, another the form of vapor or liquid, and you've got some liquid and vapor coming in from the top and bottom. <coughs> Because we have infinite reflux, we know that all of the liquid that enters had already left as the vapor. So all the vapor goes up, it gets fully condensed, and it gets spit right back in. So from that, we can conclude then that on the other side, everything that comes in has to leave as well. <clears throat> So now we're going to do a, a, a species mole balance on species K, which is such an arbitrary component. It's not I like we usually do because we've been naming the stage as I, just to confuse everyone a little bit more. So in, this, in, the, in the K balance, we have to keep track of all of the moles of species K entering and leaving the system. Again, so our balance is in is equal to out. So we have to keep track of all of the different ways that K can enter and leave the system. So entering in it could enter in as a vapor coming from below. Right? This is the amount of K entering in the V2 stream. Plus, plus the amount of liquid entering in from above, dripping down from the condenser. And then it leaves. based on the conditions within that particular stage. Okay, so <clears throat> we know that the L0 and V1 are constant. They're equal to the same. L1 and V2 are the same, right? So everything leaving here is coming back there, and everything leaving there is coming back here effectively. Not necessarily exactly the same, but at steady state, yes, everything is exactly the same. So we can take this K balance and we can simplify it <clears throat> uh, such that uh, we can come to the conclusion that just as the total amount of vapor leaving is equal to the total amount of liquid returning, it's the same thing with species K. The total amount of K leaving uh, in the vapor phase and coming back in the liquid phase is going to be equal to itself. Oh, no. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> uh, hopefully that didn't mess up the video. Likewise, we can write the same thing for uh, the other side, that da, 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 the nomenclature, I don't want to mess it up, that x k1 l1 is equal to y k2 v2. So ultimately, the conclusions we come up with is y k1 is equal to x k0 and x k1 is equal to y k2 or more generally we can write that y of k i plus 1 is equal to x of k of i. It all comes together very nicely in the XY diagram. <clears throat> So what this expression means here is that the vapor coming up from the stage below 
has the same composition as the liquid dripping down from the stage above. And this is only for the infinite reflux case, right? So the only way we can actually solve this system the way that we are is by making this assumption that we have infinite reflux. <clears throat> but again, if I was trying to make money off of this, I could not because there's no way, I'm not taking any product out. So this just tells us what the most simple minimum number of equilibrium stages that is necessary. Question. Wouldn't necessarily have to. You could just add in a different amount. You could just add in a small amount of, uh, of, of material. Okay, so <clears throat> let's draw this out on a XY diagram. So the XY diagram, let me scroll back through here. So uh, this is a TXY diagram for a water methanol system. What the XY diagram is, is if I choose a particular uh, temperature, I can get out a uh, liquid composition, sorry, vapor composition, and a liquid composition. So if I plot y of i versus x of i, that gives me the xy diagram. Right, so it relates between what is the difference in the liquid phase compared to the vapor phase. So that is the xy diagram. But I think many of you have already sort of done this on the homework. OK, <clears throat> so now we go to our y, x diagram or x, y diagram. And we have our operating condition where x of i is equal to y of i plus 1, right? So the liquid dropping down is equal to the vapor coming up. So in this particular situation, we are going to draw out a system where we're going to say that the top product is equal to 80% x1, and we have four stages. So we're just going to work out what are we going to get out of the bottom, right? So in this case here, it's going to be what is x4 equal to? What is the composition of the liquid phase are we going to get out? Okay, <clears throat> so this line right here is called the y is equal to x line. And obviously it makes sense to be useful because we have a lot of these scenarios where the x's are equal to the y's. The blue line, this is our equilibrium curve. So any time that we want to assess whether or not we're in vapor-liquid equilibrium, we have to physically be on that line. That is the only place on this plot where we have solved the vapor-liquid equilibrium equations and we know how to relate between x's and y's. So we're going to start off with right here at 80%, which is our starting point at the top of the column. We are going to draw it up, 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 up. And intersect this line. This is not our equilibrium condition. So what, what I've drawn out here is <clears throat> uh, x of zero, what's coming out of the system. x of zero is equal to y of one, based on our design rules, based on our infinite reflux. So then we draw horizontally across at constant y, and we intersect our vapor liquid equilibrium expression. In this case here, we have y1 and x1. One, right? We're in equilibrium. So that stage, right, that's it. one is the equilibrium stage one. Now that is equal to x one is equal to y two. The uh, dashed line. Now we're going to go at constant y composition. And we have another case here where we have y2 and x2, right? That's the equilibrium composition of the vapor and liquid phases for stage two 
of the distillation column. And we can see where this is going. We draw it down here. Our next design consideration is that x2 is equal to y3, horizontal line across at constant y, y3 and x3. And we have our final composition of x4, which in this case here is approximately 12 or 13 percent. So algebraically, not a whole lot of fun to do the distillation calculation on an xy diagram. Not too bad. Might, might want to use a ruler. My lines were reasonably-ish straight this time, actually. But doing a distillation calculation on a XY diagram is, well, pretty straightforward and not really all that painful. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff that we can do with this, right? If you guys remember from your separations class in undergraduate, if we don't have infinite reflux or we're not getting to the full equilibrium, you can do tie lines, you can determine the optimum stage to insert things, you can figure out, you know, uh, a whole bunch of other things. What we've done here though at infinite reflux is the minimum number of equilibrium stages assuming 100% equilibrium at each stage. And for the case of a thermodynamics perspective, that's perfect. Because in thermo, all we're focusing on is the equilibrium expression. So I don't want to worry about mass transfer problems or heat transfer problems or how big are the bubbles or all that kind of stuff. Because in thermo, everything is an infinite system, everything is infinite time. So makes sense that we would start off with this approximation. So when we talk about non-ideal vapor liquid equilibrium, we'll revisit the XY diagram when we have an azeotropic system, because uh, we have to talk about talking about uh, breaking azeotropes. Um, but for now, that's, uh, that's all I've got to contribute. Any questions? All right, have a good weekend. So, yes. <laughs>